Okay, my, my name is Andrew Pantuchin, and uh, uh, I used to be an, an active sports commuter. But recently, uh, I was involved in several, for several years now, I was involved in uh, uh, several projects where I had a chance to run FreeBSD on, on a scale, which was uh, a few years ago a high performance computing cluster. Uh, and uh, for the last two years, we're building a scalable uh, media storage, uh, streaming, and processing solution for our own needs. So, and uh, that's why uh, running running FreeBSD and uh, well Unix in general on a scale uh, with some cloud ideologies of uh, very much interest. Uh, some interest uh, for me. So, what is cloud computing? Of course, we're, we're all used uh, to the usual definition uh, of it as utility computing, uh, you know, like computing as a service and all that. But in reality, if you, if you look deeper for s several years now, it's turning, uh, the definition is uh, turning uh, into somewhat ideological one, because uh, I think like 90% of clouds now are private, and so it it really turned when Amazon launched, uh, even before Amazon launched their breakthrough cloud computing uh, offering, a lot of companies did uh, uh, experience the change to the. Uh, cloud ideology within the large-scale computing farms. It just, they, they never advertised them as, uh, with a specific term, and now, uh, and now there's a word for it. So, uh, uh, tightly coupled to the change in uh, how large-scale computing is done is uh, the change in user perspective. So, uh, it's it's not very obvious for for many of us because we're technical people, but if you start looking at at uh, younger people who are just learning to deal with computers, it's uh, it's a very obvious difference between a 16-year-old or 18-year-old and a 12-year-old because 12-year-olds uh, uh, they they really uh, they really have a more pure vision of, of computing because they started they started, uh, they started uh, well they, they never experienced the old style computing so they, they see uh, they don't see computers uh, as uh, units that perform tasks they they see them uh, more as user consoles uh, providing access to whatever services they need um, in the cloud like Facebook and uh, all those services that consume the precious time of their lives, and uh, uh, well, they don't they don't know what what a server is. At best, they know what a service is because uh, Google and Facebook provide them with services. Uh, they they don't care that uh, well. Ten years ago, if you if you type uh, Gmail dot com into your browser, then you uh, get uh, connected to a server, and if you typed it uh, ten times, you get connected to the very same server. So maybe 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was true, but nowadays it's not true anymore. You get connected to a service. Um, so uh, all this change uh, is, was pioneered by uh, a few large companies. Uh, some of them uh, are Google and Facebook. And uh, well, like I said, Amazon, when Amazon grokked cloud computing, by the time it, it started doing that, uh, Google was already successfully doing it for, for several years. I think Yahoo and other large scale companies, uh, techni technological companies have been there for a few, uh, well, for a few years already. So I think Google and Facebook, well, Google was, was one of the first pioneers. Facebook uh, just takes it to another level. And uh, there are other uh, billion dollar and bigger startups, well, not, not startups anymore, but still with, the, with this uh, startup uh, sense about them that uh, uh, pioneer the movement. 
But there's a problem with them. There's a problem with them doing cloud computing because uh, uh, they have to be they have to be very centralized. Uh, and uh, uh, well, as a result of that, as a result of lack of sharing and uh, well isolationism, uh, there are some huge inefficiencies about their operations. Uh, inefficiencies that only appeared when cloud computing became ubiquitous. Uh, so as Unix users, because most of those large-scale computing companies uh, do use Unix, they really, it's hard to find a company that uses Windows for that. Uh, wait, so I'm not sure about Microsoft. So uh, they, uh, they are really forced into doing a lot of things on their own, inventing their own solutions, because there are no solutions out there to, to grab, or very few of them, and very rudimentary. So they, they are forced to uh, invent many things on their own. And uh, as an indirect consequence of that, they really have little interest in sharing, because they don't see companies or, well, anyone who is worth sharing with, because they don't see a potential benefit in that. Uh, and so it happens that uh, with, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> much better. Uh, uh, and so it happens that uh, as, a, as a large company uh, develops their, well, multi-level product, uh, it also often repeats not, not just efforts of other companies, but also its own efforts. Because, uh, well, the, the, to every product, uh, to every complicated, large-scale, massive product, there are multiple levels of computing, uh, like front-end, back-end, and all kinds of middleware. And uh, when, you, when you look at them uh, done at large scale, you often, uh, you often find out that at each layer, there are problems that have been solved uh, in operating systems years ago, but they keep, uh, they keep trying to solve them over and over again. And the problem is on each level of the product, like front-end engineers and uh, like uh, client-side engineers and all kinds of different engineers, they have, uh, uh, they have largely varying degree of knowledge about com uh, basic uh, computing problems, basic operating system problems, and so they try to solve like uh, basic locking problems, and they don't get it right. So uh, it becomes an industry of, of uh, an industry where a lot of effort uh, is is just wasted, and a lot of problems are are not solved are not solved uh, in an optimum way. So are you sure it's better this way? Ah, okay. But, well, I'm, the slides are mostly text, and uh, yeah, they're they're online in uh, on SlideShare anyway. So uh, <laughs> uh, back to back to Unix. Uh, uh, but Unix in uh, in uh, 2011 is uh, really an operating system that's no more uh, no more suitable for performing basic tasks like. Uh, email and uh, serving web pages. Really, as an operating system, it used to do it really well, like a single Unix system could, uh, I think, like 30 years ago, a, si a single user's, uh, Unix system could handle uh, email accounts for, uh, for every internet user in the world, but now it can't. It can't uh, uh, I can't imagine a Unix system that's capable of uh, Servicing even a fraction of a percent of of those of that user base, so uh, same with web pages. It used to be really good at uh, performing basic, well, HTTP services. Now, you you can't do that with with uh, like a single Unix system. So it it has lost that capability, um, uh, and uh, well, as a result of that, if you want to build an innovative uh, innovative product. There's no question that uh, will Unix be sufficient for it. You'll have to invent 
the whole system you uh, level yourself if uh, especially if you're not uh, content with uh, one of the uh, middleware solutions out there. Um, so, and uh, when you really try to, to build a, a disruptive product, uh, so as, a, as part of a company that currently, that currently is doing that, uh, I assure you that uh, y you can't build a disruptive product without propagating disruption into every level of your uh, operations. So you, you can't build a disruptive product without uh, without trying to do disruptive things in uh, in back end or in si on system level, uh, it, all the levels require like some sort of support for that. Uh, huh? A disruptive product is uh, a one that redefines markets and really I in a very quick and uh, well, hopefully positive way. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't. Uh, uh, fit in the current uh, in the current cu on on a current on any current scale of of anything. So, uh, and uh, th the thing is, uh, so it uh, a disruptive product. Uh, anything innovative, it places by definition, it places uh, it places more uh, demands on uh, any platform that you're using. Uh, so uh, another thing about disruptive products is uh, that they uh, they usually built by open-minded people, and uh, uh, as a result of that, they they are open to uh, to stuff like open source because it it uh, uh, might sound as uh, uh, well uh, as an indirect conclusion, but in fact, uh, open source is uh, is one of the most open-minded, uh, uh, open-minded things that is happening in computing. So uh, it needs to be recognized that uh, huge products usually are very friendly to open source because because of that, because they have to stay open-minded to to compete. So as a case study, uh, what we are doing is uh, uh, we're a company that that's building. Uh, a number of media services. Uh, one of the heaviest of them is a music service, and uh, oh, well, the, the, this is a task for uh, a, well, on a scale of a hundred to a thousand uh, boxes at launch. So we we're not fully launched yet. It's a be, uh, it's in closed beta. So uh, we're we have a few uh, uh, a bit less than than a, even a hundred boxes. It's uh, eighty or ninety or something. Uh, by this time, by this day, but it's uh, already like almost two petabytes of storage. It's uh, m mostly runs uh, on FreeBSD, and uh, the thing is, uh, it's a, we like to think of it as a disruptive service, and uh, it places unusual demands on performance of every component in the, in the system, um, and. Uh, uh, well, being open-minded, we're of course uh, relying uh, completely relying on uh, the open-source ecology. So, using open-source projects, but but also trying to uh, trying to engage with the community uh, much deeper than than is usually possible for a large company. Uh, so, okay, it's not just uh, just a hundred boxes or a thousand boxes. Uh, Due to, well, for many reasons, we have to uh, we have to face a large scale of uh, heterogeneity, meaning that uh, we face many different uh, circumstances uh, for for each part of our infrastructure. For example, uh, part of the part of our machines are uh, fully owned by our company. Uh, part of that is uh, owned and a small part of is virtual. So for owned uh, machines, we host them in four distinctive, four different uh, data centers. For rented machines, that's five data centers. Uh, for, well, uh, a few virtual instances are run in yet another data center. So, and uh, each of those data centers has have different conditions. Uh, um, uh, 
uh, as for for example, we uh, the the way our uh, our machines boot is very different from from case to case. Some of them boot from uh, the usual way, way from HDD uh, hard drives. Uh, some of them has have a specific system uh, solid solid state disks to boot from and to keep swap on and to keep uh, temporary files on. Uh, other machines, a lot of uh, a lot of our own machines boot from uh, NFS using PXE, uh, and yet uh, yet another project uh, uh, as another project we're trying to uh, we're experimenting from uh, with booting from USB uh, USB attached flash media, so that uh, all of that happens uh, for a reason, and that, that just underlines that. There are a lot of differences between um, uh, between machines. If you well, if you're not building a, a high performance cluster which you can just place in a rack, if you if you really f face real world challenges like you need to to stay distributed, you need uh, you, you need uh, some part of your system must be very quickly scalable, like sca like serving web pages that must be. Uh, like you, you must be sure that you can deploy dozens of boxes uh, within within uh, a few days if you need to, and uh, of course uh, different parts of this infrastructure is facing different uh, demands on access and security. Some of these, uh, some of the well Unix instances have to be accessible only only internally. Others uh, have to serve web pages to the whole world. Uh, others have to serve other types of content, and as for security, well, some nodes uh, store very expensive copyrighted content that has to be protected at all costs, and uh, the means to do that are carefully audited by independent third parties. Other servers uh, just do some intermediate, uh, intermediate processing, they don't store anything, so th it's not uh, it's not that critical to secure them very tightly, um, but uh, of course that's that's just the tip of the iceberg, because uh, the the real uh, well uh, the real differences come when you look at the rules that uh, the machines uh, the, the boxes do. Uh, so some of them primarily do processing. Some uh, some are primarily for storage. Of course, we are trying to, uh, in in the best uh, in the best spirit of cloud ideology, we are trying to uh, uh, to keep uh, every box multi-purpose and uh, uh, to keep it easy to migrate from any task from uh, box to box. But still, there there are primary rules, uh, and of course, uh, the hardware is is hugely different, especially when you rent. Uh, when, you, when you rent boxes, you, you're never sure what exactly will you get because there are just basic specs and then all the drivers, drivers could be different. But even if you purchase for your, uh, your own boxes, it's very difficult to guarantee that, well, you know, the, the market is always on the move. And uh, so we, we started with, we started with uh, one and a half uh, terabyte drives, for example, and now we uh, we're up to three terabyte hard drives. Uh, the controllers have also changed a generation from uh, three gigabit SATA to six gigabit SATA, and that uh, that made us wait for uh, well one of the FreeBSD drivers to be committed into the main line, and uh, it's still very buggy. Well, quite quite buggy, not not very buggy, but for us we we experience bugs with firmware and drivers. Uh, and of course, the network conditions are very, uh, very different. So sometimes you own a network where the the uh, operating system is deployed, and uh, you can boot it from network. Sometimes uh, it's uh, the network is totally out of your control, and you have to uh, you, you can't use DHCP. So if you want any kind of uh, auto configuration, you have to hard code it. Uh, into configuration files somehow, like with some auto detection built in uh, uh, into some predefined configuration files. So when it comes to, uh, for us, when it comes to implementing uh, cloud ideology, uh, 
we we start uh, by looking for multi-machine uh, and uh, multi-location abstractions so that we're not anymore uh, you know we don't have to write 50 different sets of configuration files we look at uh, you know the 90 percent uh, the 90 percent of configuration that can be uh, can be kept uh, unified across all all those conditions and then uh, for a way to uh, to really keep the differences uh, in order and uh, very easily accessible and uh, changeable, maintainable for us. Uh, then, of course, uh, when you work on a scale, you have to deal with failures in a whole different way than than uh, what you used to. Because when if with a single machine, uh, it gets what one hard drive, hard drive failure per per several years. Uh, when you have like a uh, hundred machines with uh, well uh, six hundred or well, close to a thousand hard drives is a whole other story, and uh, you have to, uh, you really have to manage all those failures of hard drives, but also of uh, memory and so on. And it's not about like being redundant; it's about keeping administrative load to a manageable level because you can tolerate, you can, to of course, we can tolerate uh, a loss of any number of, or, well, uh, any reasonable number of hard drives over short periods of time because, well, we keep the content in uh, three or four or more copies. But it's all about managing that uh, without uh, keep keeping that from, from being uh, too destructive for you. So we, we only have, well, every company has only a limited amount uh, of engineers capable of uh, managing all that. And uh, it's, uh, well, as Part of cloud ideology, it's uh, uh, of course deep automation or just another level of automation, not what uh, we were used to 10 years ago when you can just, you know, script, uh, script, uh, you know, throw throw together a few ugly scripts and uh, put them put them in a cron tab. Uh, we're looking at a, at a whole other level, which culminates in uh, in uh, well. Uh, in anything from middleware, from configura configuration management middleware like Chef and the Puppet, to uh, to processing middleware like Hadoop, and uh, to some integrated solutions like OpenStack. But upon evaluation, many companies find uh, themselves not very satisfied with those solutions. So we needed something simpler, and we're working on it on its own. Um, and well. Uh, Trying to trying to apply all that po other bullet bullet points to our situation, we find that Unix uh, Unix as a cloud really sucks. So running Unix in a cloud is uh, is well something like running FreeBSD on your desktop. It 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 really works, but uh, only if you're passionate about it and if you uh, put in a lot of effort in it. So there's uh, th there's no abstraction beyond a single node, and uh, very few people actually seem to be interested in introducing any abstractions like, well, any multi-machine abstractions. Uh, there's, uh, well, virtually no tolerance of any hardware failures, but also like kernel failures. You just panic, and uh, uh, that's it. And you're lucky if your machine reboots after that and it comes back online. Uh, so failure tolerance is paramount uh, when running th when you run things on a scale, um, and uh, well, of course, there's uh, user land that uh, FreeBSD developers are inherently uh, well less interested in than in hacking on kernel, uh, and uh, the user land is mostly uh, mostly stuck somewhere in the 80s. Um, so, uh, and uh, a few specific things. So we, when we needed to do storage, we had to, uh, we, we had to, we, we had a demand for really large scale storage, like petabytes, uh, in a, well, anticipating tens, uh, possibly hundreds of petabytes later on, uh, and we had to, we had to, uh, not only have, we had to have uh, a storage. 
uh, system that also handle processing and uh, streaming directly because if you keep those systems separate, it all sounds nice, but firstly, your, your budget triples, and secondly, uh, you have to uh, have three times the engineers to maintain it all. Uh, well, so we, we used FreeBSD and we used uh, the, uh, the standard approach of uh, using one UFS, uh, UFS file system per hard drive. And then, uh, well, we just threw together a thin dispatching uh, layer that, uh, you know, that, that knows uh, where exactly each file is located. And we store files using, using their uh, hash, uh, well, uh, SHA SHA256 uh, checksums as file names so they can readily be verified. Uh, so that that works quite nicely for us, except for of course the all the distractions that are caused by uh, hard hard drive failures and uh, uh, lack of operating system support for handling them gracefully. As for processing, we we use uh, custom shell scripts, uh, not on, not just shell but also Python. We we tried a few frameworks, but they didn't uh, they didn't didn't work out for us nicely. Uh, for different reasons, but uh, mostly when you're dealing with like distributed processing, when you look at a distributed processing framework, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's usually quite over-engineered um, and uh, built for someone else's purpose. So the, the if you if you see a solution and it it is advocated as a generic one, you just need to look at who who built it, and uh, you'll have a general idea of what it was built for, and uh, most other things will be uh, not, not what it's good at. Um, so we, uh, we kind of implemented a few uh, abstract, uh, well, uh, abstractions around running, actually running some worker processes, so uh, the system is fault tolerant for uh, for software errors, well, and uh, hardware errors that result in software errors. Uh, it's all quite simple. You just have to, uh, you, you just have to uh, forbid yourself from launching anything without putting a contract upon it. And that's uh, like another thing that operating systems lack. So we were really happy to, to see uh, resource containers make it to uh, FreeBSD 9 and we'll be experimenting with that. But before that, we used uh, third-party tools uh, like time limit to limit uh, wall clock running time to safeguard from hanging processes. And, uh, uh, and we used, uh, well, built-in limits framework, which is not very useful at all. But it, it solves some, uh, some sort of problems. Um, and we, we implemented our own uh, error collection. So they, they all get into a single database, which is currently a relational database, Postgres, Postgres, Postgres SQL. But of course, uh, when, it gets, uh, when it gets more scale, it, it has to be done in, in, a, in a better solution, better suited to large scale uh, error collection and log collection. The configuration problem is, uh, is uh, one of the most frustrating ones because uh, managing managing a lot of uh, a lot of Unix instances in very different conditions can uh, result, uh, as I mentioned, in uh, in you writing like 50 sets of configuration files, uh, and all that has to be version controlled, uh, and uh, you have to. You have to have an opportunity to roll back changes and all that. Uh, that just doesn't doesn't add up. So what we're trying to do is to find a way to unify all the configuration into just a single branch. Uh, and for that, we need uh, we we need programs and services to become uh, what I call role aware. So uh, there are a few a few examples that uh, that are. Uh, of, of programs that are role aware uh, as it is. For example, the Nginx web server, uh, when you configure it, you just uh, place uh, a few different 
different clauses. One is for one server, another is for another. So you have 10 different web servers, but you have a single configuration file that is a very, well, a much cleaner solution that keeping 10 configuration files. Uh, and a similar approach is used uh, in HASD, the, uh, well, the daemon that handles the highly available storage layer uh, for FreeBSD. It's just a single configuration file for two nodes, slave and master. And uh, well, wh when it gets to multi-slave uh, functionality, it, probably, it will probably handle all that in a single configuration file too. But 99% uh, of programs don't, don't do that. And uh, it would really, it would really help if the authors, uh, like, well, uh, might start thinking about that and uh, introducing some some solutions to that end. As for uh, something like authentication and authorization, authorization, uh, I used uh, uh, I used to to use LDAP quite successfully for that, but in a very tight and centralized centralized solution like, well, a high-performance cluster, high-performance cl uh, computing cluster, where everything is very tightly together and uh, networking is reliable. But when you have a highly distributed system, it, doesn't, it just doesn't work because uh, LDAP servers fail, networking fails, and you, you just uh, get locked out of your system quite too often. So what we're now trying is keeping, is just keeping the password files like etc, pass, uh, passwd in git and uh, to my surprise it, it works quite nicely it, it, it didn't require uh, anything but uh, a very simple hook in uh, in git post post checkout uh, but of course it's just a proof of concept and something has to be devised on a more in a more uh, well classic way so to summarize the problem uh, what we're the problem we're trying to deal with is uh, well uh, actually uh, uh, an insight is that the best and the largest clouds have very busy engineers so they're not sharing because they they don't want to they're just very really busy and that's a problem because they they don't prioritize sharing because they don't believe that other companies have anything of benefit to them um, and so, like, we, we only know of two middleware platforms like Hadoop and OpenStack uh, uh, that deal with uh, some, of, uh, some of the problems arising when, run, when you run Unix as a cloud. Uh, but, you know, much more sharing could be done. And uh, I think uh, the operating system is a perfect place to, to start sharing that experience. And uh, I think BSD is uh, the, perfect, uh, the perfect operating system to start the sharing because it's an integrated kernel and user land. And uh, when, when uh, doing a cloud, you actually need changes in both uh, of those levels, both kernel and user land. So the solution, as I see it, one, one of the possible zillion solutions to, to this uh, problem would be well, maybe to uh, start advocating uh, to start advocating the problems that uh, that you stumble over when you run Unix on a scale, and we we will try to involve uh, more uh, large companies in this effort, but also uh, from the developer pers perspective to start introducing uh, some convenient features into the basic uh, into the base system for. Uh, for, for you know, for for even other middleware to function better, um, and of course, uh, just to um, ju just to embrace the the cloud ideology uh, as uh, something that that's worth pursuing that when you develop an operating system. So it doesn't need to be uh, a new operating system started from scratch, it really can be, I, I believe it can be done by just small incrementing, incremental changes uh, to, to exist in best operating systems. So that's, that's about it. We're really, uh, we're really hungry for, for new talent, uh, both, uh, 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 both when it stays in open source and just gets funding from us, and when, uh, when it's looking for, uh, when he or she is looking for 
inter an internship or a permanent position. So you, you should really get, uh, if, if uh, anything of that is remotely inter interesting, uh, you might uh, get my card and you know, get in touch with me. Uh, and maybe a split second for, for questions. It's th three minutes. Yeah, sure. It's just one of it's just one of the resource containment uh, technologies that uh, we're trying to use along with resource containers in FreeBSD nine. But it's just a small uh, a solution to a small part of a problem. Jails are good. Yeah. ZFS is yeah we we have tried it and it's running on a few uh, it's always running in in a very small part of our infrastructure for testing and different tasks but it's very slow it's uh, I d I don't believe uh, you can tune it to anything usable for us so we have to uh, huh yeah well uh, yeah it's not it's not fair. <laughs> It's not, not, so not fair comparing UFS to ZFS uh, in speed. Okay. <laughs> 10 gigabit? We, we just uh, starting to experiment. So it's not critical. We have some machines have six uh, gig one gigabit interfaces and they, they fully saturate that, uh, but it's n it's not critical for us to have more than two gigabit per machine, because well, with with even 50 streaming nodes, you have uh, 100 gigabit uh, saturated, and that's enough for like, uh, well, for a million concurrent users uh, when streaming when streaming music. So. Okay, think yeah. Something like that, but it needs to be it it it, it needs to be a very modest and uh, humbly uh, hu humble project to succeed. We don't want to, to implement a, a new file system from scratch. It's too complicated. There needs to be the the steps need to be simple, small, incremental. That's the only way to success, I believe. But yeah, that's global file system. Ideologically, is something we we're trying to do. And w I believe we're already succeeded. <laughs> Thank you very much.